Good morning. Great to see you today. I still feel like I'm in a time warp after being 10 years since I've been here. <laughs> but uh, to see some beloved brethren that I knew back 10 years ago has been a, del- been a delight, just a real joy. Well, last night we saw that the gospel has a context. And that context is God himself and his relationship to the creation. That's the context of the gospel. Without that context, the gospel doesn't have any Velcro points upon which it may be attached. And we sure experienced this in uh, dealing with students at Cal Poly Pomona. They tried to share the gospel with classmates, and they were basically talking past these students. They didn't set up the gospel within a context of the creator and the creation. So we want to imitate what the Apostle Paul did in Acts 17. He begins with creation and the creator. He gives a mini theology in Acts 17, and that sets up the context in which man's environment is Almighty God himself. That is our environment. He has literally bathed us in evidences of his existence. We're swimming in light, according to Psalm 19. The universe and creation is filled with sermons without words that cannot be suppressed entirely, although the atheist is trying to do so. Well, in this first session this morning, um, it's session two, of course, in your handout notes. We'll be going over some of the objections that unbelievers lodge against the gospel. And my premise for this section is that some of these objections will be opportunities for the gospel and not cut off points. And I want to kind of change your thinking in that area, that many objections raised against the gospel will prove to be open doors for the gospel. And I'm going to give you some case histories where I found that to be true. But some of you probably went to bed late last night. I'm just going to kind of warm you up this morning with helping you think outside the box on how to start gospel conversations. Now, this might be a very odd example, but how many saw the movie Schindler's List? Well, almost all of you. Well, then you'll appreciate this example. You wouldn't think that under the Third Reich, one of the ways to save Jews was to give Nazis caviar, cognac, and chocolate. But that's exactly what Schindler did to bring him into good graces with the Nazis so he could basically protect more Jews. He was thinking outside the box when he did that. He didn't just say, you're wicked, we got to protect you, you're bad. We know what we believe in his heart, but that's what he did. So I want to suggest some of the ways we can start a gospel conversation that maybe you've never thought of before in your life. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, I found the Ark of the Covenant. Um, it's, it's right here. It's probably smaller than you thought it was. I'm not afraid to look inside. I actually have uh, two tablets of the law in here. And I made this. I went and uh, got some gold foil at the hobby shop, and I just made this out of foam core. And this is something I use in evangelism. Uh, For all of the nations of the world at the time of Moses had emblems of their gods based upon something in creation. He looked like this, or he looked like that, or he had a scowl, or whatever. They always tried to depict God by something in the creation. Only the Jewish people of God had a visual aid instead of an idol. And that visual aid was the Ark of the Covenant. For in the Ark of the Covenant, we see that God is a God of justice. We see his law, and it has incredibly detailed, spelled out penalties for every violation and ways to be cleansed from some of the ceremonial failures. And so justice goes in the box. On top of the box was the mercy seat. And the reason it was the mercy seat is because it was spattered with blood on Yom Kippur. And so the blood of the lamb on Yom Kippur caused God to look past the sins, look at a substitute which would ultimately be Christ. And so this little box with its blood spattered lid taught the fact that God can only reconcile justice and mercy by the shedding of blood. God requires the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, it says in the book of Hebrews, also in Leviticus. 
And so this is a powerful tool. I will set this on a table at a college, and I'll start a conversation. Can you kids imagine that this is teaching what God is like? He's absolutely just, and he's absolutely merciful. And you can't name a religion in the world that can reconcile those two attributes, can you? In Islam, they cut it off. In Unitarianism, you get away scot-free. Only the gospel can reconcile these two dimensions of God, two prongs of God's character, justice and mercy. And if you're going to get saved, you must know him as just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, Romans 3, 26. You can't know God unless you know him as just and justifier. And so this is another tool I use in evangelism just to start thinking outside the box. People like something visual. Um, this is a painting which I have copied from the internet here and had it laminated at Staples. Uh, the, the name of this painting is, anybody know the name of this painting? The Great Day of His Wrath by John Martin. The original hangs in the Tate Gallery in London right across the Thames from MI6. Now, I take this painting with me when I'm talking to young people. I stop some skateboarders. I say, hey, you guys, have you ever seen the most terrifying painting ever painted in human history? No. They put their skateboards down. I want to see it. <laughs> so <laughs> I show them the painting. I go, do you know what this is? And I'll pass it around later. But you know what this is right here? That's entire cities falling into molten lava. That's pretty terrifying, isn't it? You know what that lightning bolt is? That's a picture of God's settled anger against sin. You know why this is going to happen? Because God is holy and we're not. I mean, I'm right off talking, to the talking about the gospel to skateboarders just by using this. Uh, another painting I use is uh, Caravaggio's The Doubting Thomas. And uh, maybe you know this, Caravaggio, the Italian. And uh, Caravaggio, uh, Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Who believes in me, whoever believes in me, shall live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? John 11, 25 through 26, speaking to Lazarus' sister. So <clears throat> I will ask people, do you think this really happened? That Christ stood with his disciples in a resurrected body? What do you think the, what do you think the significance of the resurrection is for you? I want you to understand something, that the penalty for sin is death and separation from God. A deathbed's a terrible place if you don't know the Lord. For all of your earthly connections, all of your hopes, every single person that you've loved and has loved you will turn into ashes on that bed and you will be all by yourself in perdition forever if you don't have Christ. He alone conquered death. He proved he conquered death. This is, a fa this is an actual historical fact. So I can introduce the gospel just by a picture of a resurrection depiction. Another one I use is a uh, diptych by Van Eyck. And this particular diptych uh, shows the crucifixion. And on this side, there's two destinies. One is you're ruled by Christ's love and holiness forever. And this one is you're under the power of the second death for eternity. And so I will ask the unbeliever, look at this diptych. A diptych is two paintings that go together. What do you think this one has to do with this one? Now, in our country, most people have been exposed to some Christianity, so they'll make some sort of association, but it gives me another opportunity to preach the gospel. This is very disarming to show people a piece of art because they're not saying, oh, you're coming at me to, to try to push your truth on me. No, we're talking about something that's outside of us here. So uh, that's my Saturday morning warm-up <laughs> before we get into the tough stuff. <laughs> and... Uh, I want to give you some examples of how objections were turned into opportunities. But in order to do that, in order to turn an objection into an opportunity, you have to be able to believe something I was unfolding last night. And that is that according to Romans chapter 1, every unbeliever is a studious suppressor of God's truth. In other, words, in other words, what he knows of God's truth in creation and in conscience, he suppresses. He seeks to push that out of his conscious mind, but he can't extinguish it completely. Now, because he's an avid and studious truth suppressor, 
when you begin sharing Scripture with him in the gospel, a work of correspondence takes place. He knows what he's hearing is real and true, though he's pushing it away. He knows it's real and true. We call that a work of correspondence. It's like resonating. It's like a tuning fork and an instrument. When you get that chord right and a tuning fork is exactly harmonizing, you get this harm, harmony happening, there's a correspondence going on in the unbeliever. If you believe that, you're going to be twice as bold in your evangelism. Second, you must be willing to see past the objection to the sinner's actual need. And that means you're going to be looking through the lens of the gospel. Here's a person made in the image of God, created for a love relationship with the Creator, and this person cannot know the Creator until they know Christ, who is the Creator. When you meet your Savior, you meet your Creator. If you believe that, you'll be more bold in evangelism. So the first one, your unsaved friend is a truth suppressor. When he hears the truth, there will be correspondence. Number two, your unsaved friend, you must look at his need through the gospel, not through his objection. He may not need to have his objection answered. And you'll find from my illustrations today that in most cases I don't answer their objection. <laughs> it's surprising. Number three, when you share the gospel with someone and they have objections, remember this. It's a conversation, not a canned speech. Therefore, you can cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he leads. Those are the three C's. It's a conversation, not a canned speech. Therefore, you can cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he leads. And that's vital. Because a lot of people, when they first attempt to witness, they have a speech and they don't feel like they've done their job until they get the whole speech said. <laughs> when actually, there's a lot of improvisation going on in a gospel conversation. A great deal of improvisation. All right, here's some stories from the trenches. And uh, I don't mind telling a lot of stories because Jesus did. It's one of the main ways he got his truth taught was through parables, right? I was on a shuttle bus to LAX a few years back, and I was chatting with my seatmate, and we were talking about good airfares to Asia, and he talked about an incredible airfare somewhere, and I said, wow, that's pretty good. I, I said, I didn't have a bad airfare to Nigeria, and he goes, Nigeria? Why would you want to go to Nigeria? And all of a sudden, somebody five years, I, sorry, sorry, five rows back said, why were you in Africa? I said, well, I was involved in a pastor's conference. He goes, in front of the whole shuttle bus, just as I thought. You went over there to take their culture away and stuff your Christianity down their throat and wreck them completely. <laughs> and so I turned around and I said, well, actually, let's think about this a moment. The closer a culture's worldview is to the truth, the more free and prosperous their standard of living will be. There's a reason why people are dying of respiratory diseases at 50 and cooking over dung in a great deal of India because their worldview doesn't match reality. I, caught, I thought I kind of had him right then, but then he said, well, I want you to know this. When the, when the apocalypse hits, only those cooking over dung will be alive. That was his reply. <laughs> and then he and then he said, and then he said, besides, Christianity is a large group of hypocrites. So there. Well, I paused for a moment. I said, sir, in all due respect, I have a question for you. Does the existence of counterfeit $20 bills mean there are no legitimate and genuine ones? Now, what do you think this guy said? He said, I am so sorry for broad brushing the whole thing. I'm glad you're on this bus. I'm glad I met you. I wish we had more time to talk. See, the issue was not his objections, was it? That's just his smoke screen to keep the truth of God at arm's length. This is how he was stiff arming me. So I don't always answer every objection directly. Our Lord didn't. I sometimes go around because I know what his gospel need is. 
I take my students uh, out witnessing from time to time. There's a big patio area by a Starbucks in my former town. And there's also a cigar store there, a favorite place to witness. Uh, we've got Hollywood editors there. We've got charter jet pilots there. It's just a real interesting mix of people. Corporate heads come there to smoke. And so uh, there's one gentleman there. We call him the resident skeptic. He looks like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> just picture his face. And so I had my students there, and they're trying to witness, and they're quivering on the inside. They're just absolutely quaking. And all of a sudden, Jack Nicholson says, everybody knows the Bible's a collection of myths. And so I said to him, what's your source on that conclusion? He says, well, philosophers. And I kind of leaned over. I said, do you know what the Bible says about those who immerse themselves in the world's philosophies? And this guy put his head down. He goes, I know what it says. It'll make you crazy. He just threw the towel in that quick. <laughs> just threw it in, the resident skeptic. I didn't become a Christian that day, but... All I'm saying is we take them back to Scripture. We show them Scripture. I used to live in a condo complex close to Master's College, and there was a gentleman there walking a dog, and the dog had a spike collar. It was a pit bull. And uh, this gentleman had quite big biceps, spent a lot of time in the gym. And so I said, man, i got to find a way to meet this guy. And so I said, hey, in our complex here, there, uh, there, a coyote's been taking some pets. I'm not too worried about your dog, but a coyote's been taking some pets. Have you heard about that? No, I haven't, yeah. And we got introduced, introduced ourselves to each other and then uh, asked what we did for a living, and he asked what I did for a living. I said, well, I'm, I'm an artist and a pastor, and I teach Bible. He goes, oh, well, I'll have to ask you some Bible questions one of these days. I said, really? How brave are you? <laughs> And he goes, what do you mean brave? I said, well, you know that truth is not something you retain in a theoretical category. Truth is something you have to live, right? And I guess that's true. I said, but there's something else you need to know. According to Jesus, sin kills objectivity. John 3, 19 through 21, sin kills objectivity. Can I ask you a few questions about your objectivity? Okay. This is only two minutes after I've met this guy. I said, do you have a girlfriend? Yes. Do you sleep with her? Yes. I said, there goes your objectivity. <laughs> now, you might have thinking, well, he probably would have wound up and gave me a chunk of his arm there, but no, this is what he said to me. Can we walk and talk? And so we're walking. It's a hot August day. We're walking, and his dog's panting, and we're walking around the whole complex, and he says, yeah, I'm a finance guy for a car dealership, and in seven years of financing, I've, already, I've only lied twice. I'm thinking, well, there's your third one right there. <laughs> so my, my comment to him was, you know, you're seeking to justify yourself. Only God can justify a person. Now, this muscle head turned beet red. He was absolutely embarrassed because he was caught red-handed. Only God can justify a person. You're seeking to justify yourself. Well, it was a hot day. He put his dog away. He says, let's talk some more. So we talked for another 15 minutes, and then we exchanged contact information. And so uh, my wife and I went home, and we're praying for this guy. And uh, a week later, I, I said to my wife, let's just drop in on him unannounced. And so we knocked on his condo door. He answered, hey, come on in. He goes, I want my roommates to hear what you have to say. So he brought his roommates and we're all sitting around the table and one of his roommates was a very gorgeous young woman, his live-in girlfriend named Kate. So they're all sitting around the table. And about 15 minutes of gospel sharing and all of a sudden Kate says, you know, that's really interesting. It's so convenient that you can live like hell and at the end of your life, I accept Jesus and it's all clear. She goes, I don't think that's the way it is. Do you have any proof for that? That's an objection, isn't it? And my point is this this morning. Was she really saying I would believe if I had a better exposure to apologetics? No. No, she wasn't. 
She wasn't even asking for proof. She was hiding her sin behind a covering. So I wanted to turn her objection into an opportunity. And so I said, Kate, I want you to know this. All love, according to 1 John chapter 4, is from God. If you don't know God, then the love you have is not the kind of love that's at the center of the universe. If you found out that your boyfriend was using you, would you be upset? Oh, yeah. If you found out it wasn't love but something else, would you be upset? I would. Did he get mad? Did he wind up? Nope. He said, we're going to cook a four-course Italian meal for you. We want you to come back. I'm going to bring more friends, and I want you to share this again. <laughs> it's the first time an unbeliever has ever set up an evangelistic dinner for me. <laughs> so we had nine people there. I presented the gospel. And that's when this man's life began to fall apart. He lost his job. He lost his condo in a short sale. His girlfriend moved out. And he's still reading the Bible through all of this. And then he moved away and I lost track of him. But six months later, I was hiking on a wilderness trail above Santa Clarita. And his ex-girlfriend was there walking with a Christian woman. And she, had, and she was walking with the Lord. Absolutely amazing. So I just want to share with you, things happen if you share the gospel. Things will happen. God is able to make them happen. The gospel is a small enough mesh net. It will catch every elect individual. And Jesus says so in John 6. All that the Father has given to me will come to me. Every single person the Father has given to me. And so why don't we witness more often? Jesus said, the fishing is good. <laughs> Fish. The fishing is good. Go do it. I think we're afraid of the objections. And so I'm trying to, de you know, I'm trying to sort of defuse objections for you a little bit today. Now, I've had objections that didn't result in gospel further con conversations, but a lot of objections do. I just want you to think that way. Uh, I had done a men's conference near uh, historic William, 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 Williamsburg, Virginia, and I was flying back from Richmond to Denver, and uh, I noticed this woman in the airport before we boarded the plane. There was like three 12-year-old girls, and she just had a mastery in handling these 12-year-old girls. I wanted to compliment this woman. And uh, it just never was appropriate, and we sat on the airplane, and there she was, seated exactly across from me, across the aisle, just right there. And I didn't talk to her for the first hour, and then I ordered some hot water and I dropped a Trader Joe tea bag into the hot water. And she goes, hey, that's a good idea. Bring your own tea bags. That's really great. And she goes, what are you doing flying from Richmond to Virginia? I said, well, I just gave a Christian men's conference near Williamsburg. She goes, oh, a Christian conference. And then she said, I'm a Mormon. I hope you don't think I'm in a cult. <laughs> Now, if I would have had a canned speech, I would have said, oh, yeah, baby, you're in a cult, big time. <laughs> it's the fastest growing cult in the world. But when you look at things through the gospel, it helps you decode objections. What she's really saying is, I'm a Mormon, and I'm stuck in Mormonism. And that came clear, that became clear in the next 10 minutes. And so I didn't say, yeah, you're in an awful cult. What I said was, are you ever troubled by the fact that all the prophecies given by Mormon bishops never come true? <laughs> are you ever troubled by the fact that the entire history of the Americas in the Book of Mormon has zero historical proof? She goes, yeah, I was a history major in school, and it bugs me to, all, bugs me to death. She says, if, if it wasn't for my incredibly dogmatic Mormon husband, I would get out of Mormonism. And so I said to her, do you know what the gospel is? She says, I really can't put it in words. I don't. And so I, I took my Bible out of my, lap, out of my laptop bag and I gave it to her. I said, would you please read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? And there we are on this plane and she's reading it across the aisle. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I said, that's the gospel. Let's just look at it together. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4.
Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and which also you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Notice everything is punctuated with according to the scriptures. The scriptures predicting his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so she read that and she goes, Okay, that's the gospel. She says, we Mormons have a terrible time understanding grace. Now, here's a woman talking this way. I'm so blessed by this. And so she said, I do teach the book of Ruth at my Mormon church to women's groups. So I said to her, have you ever seen Christ in the book of Ruth? No. I said, well, he's the kinsman redeemer prefigured there. You know what the qualifications are for a kinsman redeemer? He must be a close relative. Christ was. He became one of us. A kinsman redeemer must not be in debt. Christ was sinless. A kinsman redeemer must have the ability to pay. Christ did. He's God in the flesh. A kinsman redeemer must be willing to pay. Christ did. He obeyed all the way to the cross. Philippians 2. She goes, wow, that's beautiful. I never saw Christ in, 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 in Ruth before. I'm going to use that. I said, well, probably should get saved first. But. <laughs> so I got out this little booklet, uh, and, I'll, and those who would like to order this, it's not from me, it's from an organization in Florida, The Second Greatest Lie Ever Told. And this author says that the second greatest lie ever told is that you can be saved by your works, which, which every Mormon believes. And according to this author, the greatest lie ever told is, is that there are many paths to God. I believe that's probably not the greatest lie ever told. I believe the greatest lie ever told is you will be like God in the garden. And so I gave her this booklet, my email address, told her to read it. The nice thing about this booklet, it's got a four-page summary of every major religion in the world, and it shows how each religion is based on works and the gospel alone offers forgiveness and righteousness by faith alone. And so she took this booklet with her, said she'd read it, still pray for her on a regular basis. Her name is Natalie. So objections can lead to opportunities. That's my premise. I was uh, teaching at a church in Delhi, India, through translators, and uh, <clears throat> as it turns out, if you are a university student in Delhi, India, your lectures are in English. You must know English. And Delhi, India is a very interesting place. Uh, the most sought after jobs in that part of India are civil service jobs. Not very glamorous here, but over there, secure and high pay. You say, why is that the case? Imagine the infrastructure necessary to keep track of 1.5 billion people. There's a lot of civil service workers. And so the pastor I was working with over there had an amazingly creative idea. He says, I'm inviting civil service workers who are, un I'm inviting uh, university students who are unsaved to come with me to the slums to tutor these slum kids because the only way out of the slums is literacy. And so these kids are being tutored and they get out of the slums. And so the fact that they've done that becomes a very valuable asset in their portfolios, and they want that resume to be part of the way they get hired. And so every Saturday night, these students who come to the slums with him come to the church facility for coffee and worldview chat. <laughs> what an outreach. You got a room full of unsaved university students, and you just talk about worldview while you sit and have your coffee. So I didn't have a lot of notice and uh, he said, Jay, you're addressing the Delhi University students tonight in English. They speak English. So uh, typical of uh, pr a presuppositional apologist, I said, my topic tonight is why there's no neutrality when it comes to religious truth claims. <laughs> so <laughs> after I gave my talk, one woman raised her hand and she said, 
I don't think you're very open-minded because you've decided that Christ is the only way. Now, you know what you would say? Well, of course, you can quote John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, and that would be a good answer. But I said something like this. If you're defining open-mindedness as never landing on truth, that's the wrong definition. Open-mindedness is like an open mouth. It waits for something nutritious, and then it bites down. If you never did that, you'd starve. I must have said something like that to her. But I also talked about the uniqueness of Christ's claims and that open-mindedness does not mean that you cannot see the truth that God has declared so clearly and so infallibly in his word. Another similar situation, <clears throat> I was visiting some folks in San Diego next to UCSD, and they said after dinner, these are Christian folks, they said, hey, we've got some unsaved UCSD students who live next door. They're kind of cocky. They like to talk philosophy. How about talking to them? So <laughs> my wife and I went over there, and uh, there's four students there, and they said, oh, you're a Christian? Well, I'm going to prove to you that your God is not infinite. Okay. <laughs> they said, say, say something about him. All right. God is holy. Ah, there you go. He's not infinite. I go, what's your definition of infinite? Well, their definition of infinite was a force or form that can morph into anything. I said, God has limited himself in character, but not in power. He's limited himself in character, but not in knowledge. He's limited himself in character, but not in ways that can create the cosmos and maintain it. And the fact he's limited himself in character, he cannot lie, he cannot deny himself, is in your great interest. Because limiting himself in character makes him predictable. God and his word are one. And I said, you're betting your eternal soul that what God has said is fallible. I'm betting mine that it's infallible. And one student said to the other, it's getting kind of hot in here. Nice to meet you. <laughs> but he'll probably remember that. He had the wrong definition of infinite, didn't he? Completely wrong. Well, there's not a lot standing between the unbeliever and the mouth of hell. And God's appointed you and me to stand between the unbeliever and the mouth of hell. And you look at the different words Jesus used for believers in the New Testament. He didn't use the word Christian. It actually arose as a derogatory term. Someone who was so into Christ, he was a Christian. What are some of the words Jesus used to describe believers? He referred to them as followers, as disciples. He referred to us as those who are following him so intensely we're learning from him and we're imitating his example. In fact, he says that those who follow him, he would make fishers of men. Matthew 4, 9, 19. Matthew 4, 19. Those who follow him, he would make into fishers of men. And so those who follow him would be characterized by sharing the faith. In Matthew 10, Jesus says that those who follow me are those who live a lifestyle of confessing me as Lord and Savior. A lifestyle where you are immediately identifiable as someone who says the whole purpose of life, the whole meaning of life, this life and the next is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's someone who confesses Christ as a lifestyle. Those who are believers are disciples of Christ. A disciple is a ready, apt, attentive learner. And that's what a disciple of Christ is. Luke chapter 9. The Apostle Paul describes believers as ambassadors of reconciliation. Let's take a look at that briefly in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Now all these things are from God 
In other words, justification by faith, being made a new creature, having a new body promised to us. When this tent breaks down, we will not be disembodied. We'll have a new body from the Lord. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, brethren, that's how the Apostle Paul describes our calling. We've got a message of reconciliation. And what a message it is. The entire cost of peace with God was paid on God's side. And he did it by charging the sins of all who would believe to his son instead of to us. What an incredible message. And based upon that message of reconciliation, peace with God is offered to the unbeliever. Sometimes I'll say to an unbeliever, do you realize what it cost God to make peace with you? The entire cost was paid on his side. Why would anyone want to remain an inveterate, ongoing enemy when God has done this to make peace? Pleading with you, be reconciled to God. Pleading with you for that. The entire cost is paid on his side. Well, just in our final minutes here, I want to uh, just give you a brief exhortation from 1 Peter chapter 3. Take a look here with me, 1 Peter chapter 3. We see some guidelines here for evangelism. Verse 13, 1 Peter 3, 13. And who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify, set apart, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Now this is, this is critical because sometimes when we hear objections, we think that it's our job to pacify the objector, to somehow answer it so fully that he calms down and no longer has an objection. That's not our job. We're to faithfully bear witness of who God is and what Christ has done, but realize also that many objections arise from foolish and absurd thinking. And therefore, you're not going to completely pacify an objector by trying to make sense of folly, right? And so, the cutoff for me is this. If I see that a person is interested in the hope I have, I will go much further in the conversation. I will be ready to give an account of the hope that is in me with meekness and with reverential fear of God. And I'm doing so, according to this verse, having sanctified Christ as Lord. That's very similar to the Great Commission in Matthew 28. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. And so with that in mind, I, I'm thinking, okay, here's a person who is seeking to evade the rightful lordship of Christ, and yet the way the Lord is going to win him to himself is by the message of a bleeding Savior. That's how, it's, that's how this person is going to come to a saving knowledge if the Lord is calling that person to himself. And so be encouraged, brethren. A lot of these objections will prove to be opportunities for the gospel. I've seen it so many, many times. Open doors and opportunities. 
We agree with the unbeliever that the world is a mess. And in stating that it is a mess, we ask the unbeliever, since you think the world is a mess, what is the standard for a world that is not messed up? Can you, can you explain that standard? And where does it come from? What is the standard of a world that is right and not messed up? What would it look like? It's a great question, isn't it? Because the unbeliever knows something seriously wrong with himself and with everything else. But if he states that there's a standard for a world that is right and not messed up, immediately he's confronted with God himself and God's blueprint. We share that the only possible solution to a problem-filled world is a savior that God has sent. Mankind cannot fix it. God has sent a perfect rescuer. The God-man, he's the only one qualified to fix the problem because he's not the source of the problem like we are. If God took an unforgiven person to heaven, he would wreck the place. So Christ preached a message of exclusivism. He alone is the truth incarnate. And as such, he is the divider of all men because to reject him is to reject the truth of who he is and in so doing is to remain excluded or alienated from the life of God. And so we do defend a gospel that is exclusive and we get attacked for that from time to time. But it's so important that we learn how to defend an exclusive gospel. Man can only be restored to God through a guilt transfer, a guilt exchange in which everything that was causing the world to fall apart in terms of that rebellion, that pollution, that transgression, that wickedness, that defilement, this was imputed to the Son of God that it might be carried away and we might be forgiven. And this guilt transfer will bring about the only solution. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, it says in 1 John. He's the only one that can bring in everlasting righteousness. By responding to Christ in trust and repentance, a person is reconciled to God, receives a new heart capable of understanding how our human longings can only be met in our Creator by His love, by His fatherhood, and by His kingdom. Sometimes I'll even share this with an unbeliever. There's a reason why we cry at weddings because a family is forming. There's a reason why we cry at funerals because a family is coming apart. And those tears prove that you're created for an immutable family, a family that cannot be devastated by sickness or bereavement or, dis or disagreements. And those who come to Christ are members of a forever family. And everything you long for in family, love, joy, belonging, order, importance, dignity, everything you long for is only found in the house of God, in His eternal house, the Father's house. And so we say along with that excellent book by Tom Wells, come home forever, for the only place true home is found is in the Father's house. Amen? Amen. Amen.